I'm Angela Hansen. I'm, uh, what is my title? Assistant Professor at the University of Washington. Uh, I'm a geriatrician, so I uh, specialize in care for older adults, and I got interested in Alzheimer's research as a fellow. And so I do um, clinical care, uh, as well as research for Alzheimer's disease. So I'm gonna try to talk through, what are my objectives here? I'm going to try to talk through a little, this will be a very overview, a broad overview of some of the, the things that I work on uh, and that we deal with in our clinic. Um, so a brief overview of prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Um, and then kind of take a step back from that and think in the clinic, what do I do when I see a patient in front of me that's saying, hey doc, I, I'm having trouble remembering. You know, what do we do with that? Um, how do we think through that? and then a few pearls of, uh, that I've learned over the years about managing patients with memory loss. Okay, I just wanna see, sorry. Now I'm, I don't know what time it is, so just raise your hand when I have like 10 minutes left, okay? <laughs> so I leave time for questions. Oh, there's the clock, it's really tiny. Okay, I'm actually starting early. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start with a resources slide because if you don't, Remember, I do, so I do a lot of training with my residents, with the residents. So you may all, you may know this. So I, uh, forgive me if you already know this, but the way training works in an academic uh, hospitals, you have the medical students who are attending medical school, getting their MD, and then you have a period of residency where you train to be a doctor, and usually it's at least three years longer if you're doing a surgical subspecialty, and then you're a doctor, you can go out and practice, or you can do a fellowship after residency to get even more training. Um, so I work with a lot of residents and they're very, very busy and stressed out. So I, I, I start with this slide when I teach them in my clinic. If you don't remember anything else, remember alz.org. It's Alzheimer's Association's website. They have a million resources. Chances are they have a lot of stuff for you there. So um, there are a lot of resources out there online um, to help people. Um, both clinicians and caregivers. And I think Dr. Rhodes talked a little bit about the Area Agency on Aging. Every count, I think every county in the US, but especially every county in Washington should have an Area Agency on Aging where there's a phone number and there's some resources you can call. Okay, so how uh, we, we got a little bit of this already from Dr. Rhodes, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about the prevalence of Alzheimer's. Um, so um, when we talk about dementia, and I get this question in clinic probably once a week. What is dementia and how is it different from Alzheimer's? Um, so this question comes up a lot. And uh, again, Dr. Rhodes did a nice job, but when is it dementia? So this is kind of a more clinical definition of dementia. It's sort of excluding other things. So um, like Dr. Rhodes said, it's a decline in previous level of function. So you had certain cognitive abilities and now they have decreased. Um, it's interfering with your ability to do work or usual activities. Um, you've excluded other things and this is different from normal aging. But as you can see, as you go through each of these bullet points, it might be hard to, you could get really into the weeds on this. Well, if you don't work anymore, then maybe it's not interfering, but you technically still have dementia because you couldn't do that work. Um, so, um, so this gets a little messy in practice, but this is the kind of theoretical definition of dementia, and it's good to start with. Um, so a little bit about mild cognitive impairment. Um, so memory, so uh, just like any disease, whether you're talking about kidney disease or, uh, you know, a lot of progressive diseases, they start out mild and then become more severe. So mild cognitive impairment is that a middle ground between it's not quite normal aging and it's not quite dementia yet. Um, so problems with memory, language, judgment, thinking, greater than expected for age, but less than for dementia. So again, it's a kind of, a, it, it makes sense in theory, but in practice when you have a patient sitting in front of you, like when do you, when is it MCI and when is it dementia? I mean, that's a very difficult thing to answer, I think sometimes. And then the other thing to note is if you diagnose MCI or mild cognitive impairment in a patient, it might not be dementia. It might be a lot of other factors that may, um, they may improve. So I think that's important to stress with families. Um, 
There's a, this is from the HRSA. There's, these are a lot of treatable predictors, so things to look for to try to optimize um, so that that MCI might turn back into normal cognition. Okay, so an overview of Alzheimer's disease. Again, it's the most common cause of dementia. It is a progressive neurodegenerative disease, so it's different from normal aging. So I have to explain that a lot to families. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit what happens with the brain. Um, what is the disease? What happens at the cellular level? And then the symptoms in theory, usually the first thing is that early memory dysfunction. So you have temporal and hippocampal lobe atrophy, so parts of the brain very important for learning and memory. And the symptoms of that are asking the same question over and over, can't remember where they put their keys, have trouble remembering what they said in the conversation. And then, of course, later on, there's more impairment. How common is it? Um, so it depends on a little bit who you ask. So this is a study that I believe looked at both, all, looked at all causes of dementia. So ADRD is, of course, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, or just dementias. Um, so five million adults are diagnosed, probably under, still underrepresenting. Uh, women have a slightly higher risk of developing dementia. And then uh, it's not normal aging, but it does increase with age. So like many uh, geriatric diseases and syndromes, um, it's not a guarantee that you're going to get that if you get, if and when you get older, we all get older. <laughs> um, but it's more likely that you will have it when, when you're older. So uh, very, very rare under the age of, in this age group here, although we definitely see it. Um, and then of course the prevalence just goes up with age. Um, and then the prevalence also varies by race, ethnicity. And I think this is a really interesting topic. You know, it, is it disease itself? Is it how we diagnose it? Like what are the factors that lead to this? Um, and so I'll show you on the next slide this, these bullet points in a more graphical form. So this is data from the um, Alzheimer's and Dementia Journal from 2018, so pretty recent. I guess the data is from 2014, but it was published in 2018. So um, what we're looking at here is um, the white bars are the younger, the youngest group, and then the middle group, and then the oldest group. And then they're broken out by ethnicity and race. And we can see for every group, the prevalence increases with age. That's not too surprising. And then we do see some pretty significant differences in prevalence um, depending on um, ethnicity and race. So like I talked about, or like we talked about in the last slide. Um, so um, uh, African Americans do have a higher um, rate of all, Alzheimer's and related dementias than Caucasians um, at all the age groups. And then um, Hispanic also have a higher prevalence. Um, American Indian, Alaska Native, it depends on which age group you're talking about, but there does seem to be a little bit of an increased risk. And then um, Asian and Pacific Highlanders seem to have a slightly less risk at the older ages. So there's a lot to, that you, you, know, you could spend your career, I think, on just studying this graph. I mean, many people do. Um, so I just wanted to briefly talk a little bit. I think we, we study this. Uh, there's more data on this, um, on this group, um, uh, or there at least there still needs to be more data in, in all of this uh, topic. But um, like I said before, Alzheimer's disease is more prevalent among African Americans compared to Caucasians. Um, and it looks like the genetic risks tend to be higher as well. Um, so not only there, there may be some genetic or some genes that are more common in this group, but the genetic environmental factors interact differently. So I study a gene called APOE4 or E4. Um, it's a gene you can get from 23andMe. Um, so some people may know their APOE status. Um, we don't clinically, we don't routinely measure this in clinic, but I, I measure it in research settings. It's a gene that increases your risk for Alzheimer's, but it doesn't increase the risk for Alzheimer's the same in every uh, group. And it, it looks like, although African Americans are at higher risk to develop Alzheimer's disease, it looks like APOE4 is not, is, it's not explained by APOE4. When they have APOE4, it doesn't seem to increase their risk as much. So. Um, 
so there's um, not, a, you know, so it's not just a, uh, easy to explain with, well, they have this gene and this other group has this other gene. It seems to be quite more complicated than that. Um, and then one thing to think about with all of these disease, all of these neurodegenerative diseases is what role are vascular risk factors playing? And we'll talk about that more in one of the slides. Um, there are some uh, studies about uh, Alzheimer's risk in uh, native groups, um, but they're, again, small studies. They're, you know, again, it needs to be uh, done more. So um, one study I thought was very interesting. So uh, Smith and colleagues in 2008 reported the prevalence of dementia um, by the DSM-IV criteria. That's the kind of psychiatric Bible, if you will. Um, 27% uh, among Australian Aborigines, which is five times higher than Australian population. So this is very different than the native uh, population that we have in the USA. Um, and so, you know, trying to parse through, like, why are they seeing a higher risk? Is it, are they diagnosing different? You know, what, it, what is going on there? Uh, so again, we just, this is a, a topic that needs to be studied a lot further. Um, I mentioned that APOE4, so similar to um, certain African populations, um, in, uh, w in a couple of different po uh, studies, APOE4 was not found to be a risk factor in those groups. So that, um, again, genes alone just don't explain much. <laughs> it's genes and environment interactions, and so what is it about, about that um, particular interaction where it's a, strong risk factor in one group but not in another. So that's, I think, a really important thing to keep studying. Um, okay, so just in general, what do we know about risk factors for Alzheimer's disease in the USA? This comes from a study from uh, uh, Dr. Barnes and Dr. Yaffe in uh, UCSF in San Francisco. So here's what they did. They took a whole bunch of epidemiologic studies and pooled them together and said, okay, Best, ma best case scenario, what are the risks um, of getting Alzheimer's if you have these different risk factors? And then what they did is they calculated, okay, well, how many people have these risk factors and did math with, we know how many people there are in the United States and we know how many people, in theory, you know, have these diseases. How, if we could reduce these diseases, how many cases of Alzheimer's would we prevent? So this is population-based, hardcore epi uh, work, and this is what uh, they came up with. Um, what they came up with is that a lot of Alzheimer's cases could be preventable in the United States. So what we're looking at here is if we reduce diabetes by 10%, Sorry, the legends seem to go away. Um, if we reduce diabetes by 10%, some like wave a wand or change our diet or do something, um, if we reduce diabetes by 10%, this is how many Alzheimer's cases we'd prevent. And so on down the line. Um, and then the combined, if we reduced all of these things by 10%, we'd reduce Alzheimer's by about this many. If we reduced Alzheimer's, or if we reduced all these diseases by 25%, we could prevent 500,000 cases of Alzheimer's. Um, on um, a slide I previously, um, I, I give this talk to a lot of community groups and I usually have a little arrow that springs up and says, Congress pays attention to this. This is a big deal, right? This is, these are big numbers. States will save money on Medicaid and like, a, this is a big number. So um, the, the point of this is again that um, up to half of all Alzheimer's disease cases are potentially preventable if we change our lifestyle and things like that. Um, okay, there are some caveats to the study. A lot of those risk factors are not independent. Um, that being said, I think it's still important work to do. You know, we're all going to age. How do we age better? Because the whole world is going to just keep aging. You know, we're, I don't think we're going to go back uh, to live, you know, life expectancy really low. So, and we shouldn't. Um, what were the biggest risk factors in the United States? It was smoking and physical inactivity. Those were the two biggies. If you're doing numbers and you want to just, like, if you only have a certain amount of public health dollars and you want to put them somewhere, that might be somewhere to start. Worldwide, I thought this was really interesting. It was low education level. So children not going to school for that many years. Um, so we're talking like primary education, not all our fancy degrees, uh, although that does help. 
Um, so I thought that was really interesting because I'm a geriatrician, right? But this is a pediatric I issue, you know, that's leading later to dementia. And, you know, when we talk about the world and, you know, kind of the world economy and, and uh, working together with other countries to get children in school and, I don't know, it just, it, it was a very interesting um, thing to read. And what they wrote in their paper was that education and mental stimulation throughout life are believed to lower the risk of Alzheimer's by helping build a cognitive reserve that enables individuals to continue functioning at a normal level despite experiencing neurodegenerative change. Um, so, um, so this is important and you know, it's important in our communities. Of course, there are 900,000 reasons to support primary education and improving our own schools. Um, but here's one more, you wanna prevent Alzheimer's. So if there's communities particularly that are not um, getting access to good primary education, you know, failing schools in inner cities or rural education not as good as, you know, suburban, that's a big deal. So, and we should say stuff about it and vote and stuff. Okay, so part one summary. Um, so um, I talked a little bit about um, how uh, age and ApoE4 are two kind of unchangeable risk factors, but there are a lot of modifiable risk factors, uh, something we all share as Americans and can work on together. So reducing smoking, increasing exercise, uh, treating high blood pressure, things like that are all things that we can do to reduce dementia and Alzheimer's risk. Okay, so switching gears a little bit, when I see a patient in my clinic that's complaining about their memory or their families dragging them in and complaining about their memory, um, how do we um, address that patient and what do we do? So I always start with a case when I have um, uh, my residents um, because I think it makes it very real. So uh, I'll present this case to my uh, residents. I'll say, okay, we have Mr. Jones. You're seeing him for the first time. Um, he's a 75-year-old man. He has high blood pressure, hypertension, heartburn, or GERD. And he's new to the clinic. He just moved here. Um, he has his agenda, right? He has a little list of things he wants to talk about with the doctor. Um, and you have, what, 25 minutes is a new patient visit? Um, he wants to discuss his meds. His seasonal allergies aren't doing great. His heartburn's not doing great. His blood pressure on uh, triage is 160 over 90, so that's high. Um, and so you're getting ready to prescribe him a, a second blood pressure medication. And his daughter says, you know what, doc? I'm worried about my dad's memory. He might not be taking his meds properly. Does he have dementia? And she just looks at you with a very concerned look on her face and you have two minutes left in the visit. <laughs> This is very realistic, I think. Ah, <laughs> what do you do? So I teach, I try, try to teach my residents sort of how do we, how do we deal with this problem? Um, and what I'd say is a journey, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And I think about memory loss as kind of a big um, picture that affects a patient's life. So almost all the residents say, well, I'd probably not prescribe the additional me medicine agent. I say, okay, we need to get him a pill box, so make sure he's taking his meds properly before we go throw more meds at him. And then let's set aside an, another visit to talk about his memory, like soon. So they all get the answer right, so it's very exciting. Um, so cognitive impairment, or uh, I like to think of cognitive impairment as a geriatric syndrome. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of contributing factors that interact. And this is true about a lot of geriatric <coughs> syndromes. So falls would be another one. Why do older people fall? It's a combination of their sensory impairment and the environment, you know, it's not just one thing. And that's true even if someone has Alzheimer's disease. You know, they're gonna have good days and bad days or they're gonna have good weeks and bad weeks. And um, so there's a lot of factors. And just in our own lives, we can tell <laughs> there are factors to our own cognitive impairment, um, like sleeping and things like that, not sleeping. Um, so um, the geriatric syndrome, here, so medical diseases, so diabetes and um, variations in glucose and sodium, thyroid diseases, obstructive sleep apnea or other sleep disorders. Um, medications, so medications people take or p medications they get from us uh, can cause you uh, to have some confusion. Psychiatric conditions, um, you know, in older adults, a lot of times they're dealing with grief from their sisters dying or their partner dying, and how does grief play into cognition in these folks? Um, 
caregiver support. Someone might function much better if they have a caregiver um, or if they don't. And then finally, the disease itself. So you notice it's just a small part of this. I mean, a lot of things affect someone's day-to-day -day functioning and memory. Uh, so what do we do as dementia providers? I think we have a lot of tools in our toolbox. Um, and we get fancy, and we have a lot of fancy testing. But really, it almost always comes back down to the history. And I think this is true for you know, any population. So um, that, that history, that narrative story about this patient in front of you, that's what's really important. Um, and then we'll do a physical exam, we'll do memory testing, we'll do blood work imaging. Sometimes we get fan like even fancier with our testing. Um, and it really depends on the individual patient, um, wh who, who's going to need what. So what I tell my residents is, what are we looking for when we take this long history? We're looking for kind of three things. One is reversible causes. So we learn these in medical school. There are actual causes of dementia that aren't dementia. Like they aren't Alzheimer's. You know, they're not neurodegenerative per se if you treat them early enough. So B12 deficiency, thyroid deficiency, um, HIV, dementia, um, drugs, and things like that. Um, this is less likely that you're going to find a reversible cause in a patient, especially if you're, well, I would say me in my clinic, people that are referred to me are less likely to have just like this, oh, we stopped a medication and they got completely better. But that can happen and I've seen it. And especially if you're dealing with a more acute onset of cognitive uh, complaints. This I think is a lot more likely. We're looking for contributing factors. So kind of going back to that overview, so you, you may not cure someone's Alzheimer's disease, but if you trim down their med list, you know, get them sleeping better, nutrition, that kind of stuff, you may improve their cognition quite a bit. Ultimately, that daughter was staring at you. You know, what they all want to know is, does my dad have dementia? And that's a good question. And sometimes when I see a patient, I walk out, me and the resident kind of walk out and go, I don't know. I honestly don't know. We're going to have to think about this one and rule things in or out and, and, and diagnose over time. And it's okay to diagnose over time. You know, if there's something that's really unsafe, like someone's driving and they're running into stuff, or if there are unsafe things that you do need to act more urgently. But because this disease is a slow progress or sl uh, progresses slowly, it's okay to like take some time. You know, you don't have to get the patient and the caregiver to say the word Alzheimer's that in the first five minutes. You can say, oh, you have memory trouble. We're going to work the, on this together and kind of partner together to um, come to an understanding about what's going on. Um, so what do we do? So there are some screening tests that we, um, we recommend for the general population. So um, screening tests are basically... There's kind of, so I want to distinguish screening from diagnosis. So sc screening is looking for something that you didn't know was there before. So like screening for cancer, most people are aware of that. You get a mammogram to see if there's a tumor in there that you didn't know was there before and otherwise was not causing any symptoms. So that's sort of screening. Screening for dementia is a little kind of not correct with language because if someone has dementia, by definition, they have symptoms, right? So it's not really screening, it's just being thorough. <laughs> so um, if, you, you know, if you don't ask a patient if they're abusing alcohol and having symptoms, then you haven't diagnosed their alcohol use disorder, but like they still have it, and they're still dealing with it, and it's affecting their life every day. You just didn't ask about it. So I kind of want to make sure we distinguish screening for a disease that has symptoms from I think when other people think about screening, they're thinking about, oh, looking for Alzheimer's when it's so early you can't even do anything, like you're 50 years old and you're going to get it in 10 years. So what I'm talking about for screening is asking if they have dementia, basically. Uh, you know, kind of like an oil dipstick. You know, is your oil empty or full? You know, so rather than a predictive test, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, these are three tests that have been developed um, that are short. They take three to five to six minutes to administer, so they're more realistic for a clinic to do. Uh, MAs and nurses can be trained to do these. They're pretty simple. So a mini-cog is asking someone three items 
and then to draw a clock. Um, uh, 88 or Alzheimer's 8 is basically asking the caregiver a bunch of questions. The patient doesn't even really need to be there. And then a GP cog is a combination. Um, I like the mini cog and the GP cog because it has this clock draw. It's very visual for patients and families. Um, and again, they can all be administered. So these are short tests and if someone screens positive, then they need more workup. It's kind of like the mammogram. There's a spot, now we gotta go do stuff. It doesn't tell, like you don't get diagnosed with breast cancer in a mammogram. You identify that there's a problem that needs to be worked up further, then you need a biopsy. So these are not diagnostic, these are just, hey, something's up. Um, and so there's longer tests, and these are what we do in our clinic because we have the time to do it, and we, are, people kind of already screened in when they're coming to memory. You know, they're already saying, hey, I have trouble with memory, and so, okay, we believe you, <laughs> let's see what's going on. So uh, MOCA, uh, how many people have heard the word MOCA in a non-Starbucks setting? <laughs> so uh, Montreal Cognitive Assessment, and it's, it's the test that we use in our clinic. It's, it's a little bit harder than some of the other memory tests, but it has been um, really well validated in a lot of different cultural populations, and it's less biased for education level. So it's kind of nice because it's real. It's good for people that are highly educated because it's harder, but it's also validated for folks that have different education backgrounds. Um, and then there's other tests that have kind of weird acronyms, so MOCA and SLUMS and real stuff. Um, I did in my research for this. Um, came across this um, screening test called the CDIS, and I have a slide on it on the next slide. Um, it's a little, it's longer, um, so 30, it's about, it takes about 30 minutes, but there is a briefer version that um, only has seven and then six items, so seven items for the patient and six items for the caregiver. And this is increasingly being validated and studied in several world populations. So this is on my to-do list to kind of learn more about this. Um, because we, uh, certainly at Harborview, we see such a diverse group of patients. Um, so what the CDIS is, again, the Community Screening Instrument Dementia was developed during the course of the CREE studies to provide a culturally fair, reliable, and valid screening instrument for dementia um, that could be used in the cultural, linguistic, and educationally distinct um, populations of Manitoba. So just kind of an aside on this. So. Uh, like I said, we use the MOCA, or the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, and it has, um, there's some drawing, there's some motor skills, there's different parts of the test that, that um, you could see or um, um, kind of get at someone's cognition in a variety of ways. But the five words that they use are face, velvet, church, daisy, red. And so, okay, velvet and church, let me just, <laughs> So we see a lot of um, Asian Americans or Asian immigrants at Harborview. And for example, at Laotian population, they'll say face, I'll say face, and the interpreter will say something, and they'll say velvet, and it's like an hour long time. Like for them to translate velvet, velvet just does not translate well in some languages. And then church also, they do they say temple. So I mean, just those five words are sort of like troublesome. So when we translate these, um, you know, so what, what I would say is that for non-English speaking patients, is it just kind of be aware that when there's words that are developed in, when, when they're words, it's tricky. Um, so the woman that developed the um, mini cog, uh, the, the shorter test with the clock, she did a study, and it's sort of obvious, but if you use word, like she studied a veteran population, so the VA, uh, veterans of war, of the military, sorry, um, veterans versus um, civilians, and words like patriot and flag are much easier for them to remember than like velvet and what was it, you know. So I mean, it just kind of makes obvious sense, right? So, um, so I think getting back to the IQ points and all of that, when, when it's language-based, just be skeptical of, of norms. So you just want to be very careful um, when you're interpreting things. And again, velvet just is a weird word. Anyway, um, so that's my little pearl about that. Um, and then, of course, you want to make sure you're not just testing someone's hearing. Like, face, velvet, what? Huh? You know, if they can't hear you, they're not going to remember it. So, um, 
Uh, Dr. Rhodes does this for us, uh, neuropsych testing. So um, it's, it's an intensive day, so three to four hours. So I kind of like that 30 minute one because it's sort of like a snapshot, but it's a little more involved um, than um, the uh, 10 minute test. Um, and they can really get at norms. And there's a lot of uh, fairly well validated norms that we can use for patients who don't, who in, whose English is not their primary language or they didn't go very far in school. We do have ways of sussing some of that stuff out. And I like this neuropsych testing because it also identifies strengths. You know, I'll see a patient that has really strong verbal memory. I'll say, we can use this. You know, you still have a lot of your language and your reading, um, so let's keep using that. Or, you know, if, they're, if visual memory is good, we can make sure and put pictures on things. Um, so neuropsych testing is helpful for a lot of reasons. Um, we get a lot of imaging, of course, um, and Dr. Grabowski, I believe, is going to talk a little bit about this. Um, but uh, head CT looks for big, th obvious things. Usually we're getting an MRI. So a brain MRI, it's a big magnet. There's no IV involved. It's, very, it's safe. There's just nothing that could happen to you. Um, so um, it's very sensitive, and we'll see a couple pictures of uh, brain MRIs. Um, PET scans are functional, so can the neurons take up glucose and function? So MRI is just like a fancy picture, whereas a PET scan is functional. And if you have dementia and it's very early, your MRI might actually look normal. So we want to counsel, you know, um, primary care doctors, if they're getting an MRI, you don't want to say to your patient, oh, you'll never get Alzheimer's, you don't have Alzheimer's, your MRI looks normal, because the MRI might be falsely normal early on in the disease. Okay, so remember Mr. Jones, he had hypertension and his daughter's really worried. Um, so let's say you bring him back and you do a mini cog and he draws this middle clock and he only remembered one of three words. Okay, so now what do we do? So he probably needs a workup for dementia. Um, the causes of dementia in older adults in the U.S., so number one and two and three, <laughs> number one is Alzheimer's. So I tell my residents, if you think it's Alzheimer's, it's probably Alzheimer's, it's, you know. If it's a little atypical, eh, it's still probably Alzheimer's. It's just so much more common. And then the second uh, and third, depending on who you ask, the next one will be vascular, or it will be Lewy body slash Parkinson's disease related dementia. Frontotemporal dementia is another dementia that we see, and it's, it's kind of rare, but it's common enough to where I've seen quite a few cases. Traumatic brain injury is also out there, and then there's just some other causes that we've Think about mixed is common. So if you're older, you can have more than one thing. You can have vascular and Alzheimer's or Parkinson's and Alzheimer's together. And think, I tell my residents also things don't always add up. There's what the textbook says about the disease and it's supposed to progress in this way and these are the symptoms and then there's the patient. And sometimes they add up and sometimes it's like, yeah, you get a PET scan back and you're like, I did not expect that. So. Um, it's, it, there's just a lot of diversity in the brain. Um, so to diagnose Alzheimer's, there, we think about it in three stages. Um, Preclinical, so a research definition. Um, so they got an amyloid scan for whatever reason and they seem to have Alzheimer's. Changes, mild cognitive impairment and then Alzheimer's disease. Um, early onset we talk about is uh, around uh, age 60 or less. And if that happens, it's often a gene in, that runs in a family. Uh, late onset is what we see more often, um, and it is increased in the uh, individuals that have the APOE gene. So this is not a gene that causes Alzheimer's the way these genes do. It's more of a risk factor. Um, and then it's characterized by extracellular plaques, um, intracellular tangles, and neurodegeneration. And there's some other uh, pathologies that happen as well. So just to diagnose Alzheimer's disease, first you have to diagnose again that they have dementia. So there, there's something going on. It's causing them to have trouble. It's declined from their previous level of function. So all general dementias are all diagnosed in that way. Um, and insidious onset and progressive course. So it usually kind of goes like this. How long has it been going on? Well, about a year. And then you look and they had an MRI two and a half years ago and the indication was memory loss. It's like, oh, a year. Oh, well, and then the daughter's sitting, oh, mom, remember, you know, Mr. Jones, or, you know, dad had trouble at the wedding, he couldn't remember. 
to, and they just sit there and argue for an hour about how long it's been going on. That's Alzheimer's, I mean, that's classic Alzheimer's because it's insidious, right? It happens so slowly. And then sometimes people that live with someone don't see it because it's every day and it's so gradual. And then someone will come to visit and go, you know, mom, dad's not, this isn't how he was at my wedding. And, and so the history is really, so getting back to that, what test do you need? The test is get a daughter to come to the visit, you know, or get another person to come. Because the history is just so important for this disease. Um, and the, uh, uh, Dr. Rhodes talked about the domains, so impaired ability to acquire and remember new information. That You'll we'll hear the word amnestic. So who here has heard of amnesia from like television? And it's like someone doesn't remember their name. Yeah, that's not a thing, really. So <laughs> basically, how they, per, uh, how they portray amnesia in movies is really, really fun and a fun movie trope, but it's just not. You remember who you are uh, um, pretty, pretty long. Um, what you forget is what you had for breakfast yesterday. So, um, you know, like veterans remember their name and last four, like <laughs> for, forever. Um, so, um, but what, uh, amnestic is, means amnesia. So you have trouble remembering new information. So nestic is remembering, and then amnestic is forgetting. I hope I have the Latin correct on that. Um, so um, amnestic uh, memory impairment, and then later on you develop more uh, troubles. Um, it's, it's characterized by atrophy or shrinkage of the brain. Partic so all over, and then particularly in the areas important for learning and memory. And we can see that on an MRI. So hopefully you can see this okay. So here's a normal hippocampus. We're looking at a coronal view. So as if you're looking, they're looking right back at you. And then here's the hi hippocampus, which means seahorse in Latin. Um, it's atrophied or shrunk. And the space around it is bigger. And then the pathology is these tangles and plaques um, that you can see. Um, if a pathologist got a hold of the, the tissue, it would, uh, that's the pathology. Um, I'm going to just briefly talk about vascular dementia because I think we have a whole talk on that coming up. Um, but what I would say is, so when I, in medical school, I learned that vascular dementia was you have normal cognition, and then you have a stroke, and then you don't. OK, well, that's pretty easy to diagnose. Um, you can also get vascular dementia by having these mini strokes, and they talk about this stepwise cognition. So on January, in January there was a decline, then another decline. I can just tell you in practice, this is just, it's a lot more messy than that, and I think there's a lot of overlap and um, a combination of Alzheimer's and vascular pathologies kind of doing, uh, sort of antagonizing each other, and we'll, I'll be, I'm staying to hear Mike's talk, so I'll be excited to hear what he tells you about this. But, Vascular um, dementia is, is a really big deal, and all those, vascu all those risk factors for plain old Alzheimer's I told you earlier, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, those are also risk factors for vascular disease. So, so I talk a lot about vascular disease in my clinic, and we may, we may diagnose someone with kind of mixed, like maybe there's a little Alzheimer's, maybe there's a little vascular, um, and then we treat both. So here's some white matter change that shouldn't be there. This was a case that I took from the internet. Here's his story, an 82-year-old man with slowly progressive memory impairment, but turns out he was more vascular than Alzheimer's. So this idea that Alzheimer's is progressive and vascular stepwise, I think is a little bit more messy in real life. But that might be my bias towards stuff. Uh, Lewy body dementia is, um, uh, so Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease are um, sort of cousins or sisters, I guess, they have, they, they're caused by the same pathology, but where you get these Louis bodies, so Dr. Louis was a person, and he, de he described these, um, these uh, inclusion bodies called Louis bodies, and um, if they occur in one part of the brain, you get Parkinson's, if they occur in other parts of the brain, you get Louis bodies, so they're very much related diseases. Um, and the way that we diagnose that is that someone has a lot of variation in their alertness, they have well-formed visual hallucinations, so they see animals or people or spiders, or um, they just see things that aren't there. Um, they have REM sleep behavior disorder, which means they act out their dreams at night or sleepwalk or sleep talk as an older adult. 
Um, and then they have Parkinsonism features, so tremors, difficulty moving, um, things like that. Um, and then there's kind of ways to diagnose um, with imaging. Um, and their cognitive testing is a little different than Alzheimer's. So again, they, they have a lot, like one day they just seem very alert and the next day they're more sleepy. Alzheimer's doesn't have that quite as much. Um, and then their visuospatial is uh, a lot more impaired. Um, frontotemporal dementia is um, a rarer d dementia and it occurs a little bit younger. It's more likely to be genetic. Um, and there's two main variants, and I'll show you that on the next slide. Behavioral variant and then language variant. And this is kind of the way I think about things. I like to think about things in big categories. So frontotemporal dementia, behavioral variant. There's kind of plain behavioral variant, frontotemporal. And then there's some what I call mimics. And then there's this disease. And this is, I wish every disease was named like this primary progressive aphasia. The name of the disease tells you the thing. It's primary, in other words, it's the main cause. Progressive, it progresses aphasia, they have aphasia. And aphasia is difficulty finding words. So um, in my utopia land, well there won't be diseases I guess, but in my, <laughs> in my utopia land, diseases are named for what they are. And um, this, uh, people will present with, I just can't seem to find the right word. I have a patient who came to me and the first thing out of her mouth was, I'm having trouble remembering the names of things, like the things that go up and down and cover the windows. That was her statement to me. And so she diagnosed herself. I mean, she told me what she had. She has primary progressive aphasia. Um, so um, uh, they may look like a stroke, except their MRI doesn't show a stroke. Um, these people will eventually develop behavioral changes, and behavioral folks will eventually develop aphasia, but if, um, it's nice to think about these a little bit separate because of the, how they present to you. And behavioral variant, which is the most common version of that, so early behavioral disinhibition, socially inappropriate behavior, loss of decorum, impulsivity, a lot of apathy, loss of empathy, um, early perseverative, stereotyped, compulsive behavior or speech. Um, binge eating, so some, sometimes what we hear are people just crave a lot of sweets. Other times it's a little more dramatic than that and people will eat food out of the garbage or things like that. Um, and then the neuropsych profile, their memory is pretty good, but it's just this executive function. So Dr. Rhodes talked to you about executive function. This, this is where executive function goes quite awry. And it's because the frontal lobes are atrophying. And those, those uh, a lot of what our brain does is inhibit. So you can imagine, you took in a lot of sights and sounds on your way into Seattle today, and your brain can, needs to filter a lot of that out so you can just run from the bear or drive on I-5. Um, when we lose our inhibitions, then we start seeing hallucinations, we start confabulating things that didn't happen, um, and we start, um, losing our inhibitions to say inappropriate things at meetings, like we heard earlier. Now again, it has to be a change in their personality. Some people are just that way their whole life. And then you wonder, what's going on there? But that's a whole other field and I don't study that, so. <laughs> um, all right, so this is a PET scan of someone with frontotemporal dementia. So in, pet, in uh, PET scan world, so PET scans were, I think, initially developed to study cancer. So cancer cells take up all the glucose and there's a dot in someone's lung that's really bright. In the brain, PET scans are darker, so you're looking for a loss of a glucose signal. And here we see the, front, the frontal lobe there is decreased and it's very asymmetric. And it just kind of correlates with the MRI image. So to formally diagnose dementia, um, we want to work it up in a standardized way. Um, we want to know the criteria for the most common forms of dementia. People might have more than one thing. It's okay to diagnose over time, and the history is really important. I think we're doing okay on time here, so I'll just go over a little bit of management stuff. Um, so this is um, this was a really um, this is a topic that I would love to spend a lot more time on is cultural factors in dementia. So I mentioned earlier I work at Harborview, and we have a, a very diverse patient population. Um, particularly a lot of immigrants and just different family structures and things. And, you know, I'm often struck by sort of the, um, I guess there's a dichotomy of on the one hand, 
this disease affects everybody. You know, nobody wants their loved one to be, you know, having these troubles and struggles and, and having scary hallucinations and those kind of things. So that, and I think in every society, you know, there's caregivers don't, you know, you know people don't want to be a burden to their caregiver. You know, I hear that all the time. I don't want to be a burden. I, I hear that, you know, over and over. On the other hand, I do think, so I think this disease is sort of kind of leveling us all, makes us all share humanity. Uh, on the other hand, I do think there are some important cultural differences, um, and not even necessarily between cultures so starkly, but just there's different family structures of how people um, view family, how they view caregiving, how they view um, responsibility to elders and things like that. There's a lot of difference between urban and rural. There's a lot of difference between cultures. Um, and um, Wendy Holko wrote a really nice paper about this, and uh, Annika kind of shared that out. I put this uh, resource here. Uh, but just a lot of different, really neat ways that memory loss and aging is viewed differently. Some ways that it's viewed the same. You know, I think there's a quote is, I just, I'm so frustrated when I can't remember. Like, I've heard that from every patient, you know, right. Um, but, uh, but, you know, different ways of dealing with it. And so I think this is really hard to distill to a few bullet points. But I think a lesson I'm trying to follow is uh, keep learning, keep listening, and avoiding assumptions. You know, we don't want to fall into traps of avoiding, like, very, you know, um, broad cultural stereotypes about, you know, city dwellers or people from a native group. Or, you know, we don't want to avoid, we want to avoid assumptions. But also, we want to allow families to express their ideas and questions in a very safe environment. So just saying, you know, uh, you know statements like, this must be hard, you know, how are you doing? And, um, is this hard for you? And, you know, allow people to have, have that space to say, actually, you know, it's not so bad. Like, I don't mind the caregiving part. The part that I think is hard is, something else. So, you know, give people kind of the permission to express their views, however that may be. And um, like I said, I just, I love working at Harborview and seeing all sorts of variety of uh, ideas. And, and again, this is a shared illness that the world is all, we're all dealing with right now. Um, so we, uh, how do you assess a caregiver? So you can formally assess with various tools and surveys and that, um, uh, toolkit that was developed for the Cree study, the CSID, I think was the acronym, does look at caregiver and um, patient factors. Um, I think also just informal assessments, like how are you doing, you know, how is your health? Um, and what I tell my residents is this is a skill that I continue to work on, um, is how do you do patient-centered care, but really you want to know how the caregiver is doing? So you don't want to talk over the patient the whole time with the daughter, right? Like imagine Mr. Jones. I just have a talk with his daughter the whole time, and Mr. Jones is sitting there like, excuse me, I kind of want to talk about my, my heartburn. You guys aren't even listening to me. You know, how, imagine how that would feel. Um, on the other hand, when someone has memory loss, you really do need to get that caregiver assessment. And again, give them that, that safe space to talk. In, in a very respectful way about their loved one. And they might feel really uncomfortable saying, like, Dad, you don't remember anymore, you know. And so I've tried to learn skills around this and, again, continue to learn them. And one way I do is the patient always sits and I always try to engage with the patient. I use the word memory loss a lot because I think that's a little more kind of, we can all say we have memory loss and it, it isn't so jarring. Um, and, you know, hey, Mr. Jones, you know, what I'm hearing is, you know, your memory loss makes it hard for you to take your medications. How's that going? And then he might be like, yeah, it is hard. How can you help me? Um, and then again, um, even if the caregiver asks a question, I talk back, talk back. <laughs> I reply to the patient. And so I'm talking to kind of both. And I think most caregivers kind of get what I'm doing, you know. <laughs> um, but this is hard. I have to admit, this is hard. When I wor first worked at the VA, and this was an interesting kind of cultural experience for me. So I worked at the VA, I was a brand new doc, you know, I'm this kind of small lady and I'm dealing with these veterans, like combat veterans. And I'm thinking, you know, this guy can't drive anymore, but he used to, you know, run like, you know, the military, you know, uh, big chunks of military. How do I, tell, how do I have this conversation? And a lot of times what we do is I talk to his wife without him being in the room to try to get like a sense, you know. And then I learned, actually, you don't need to do that. You know, there are times where you, you need to do that for safety reasons, but 95% of the time, you can model good caregiving and good communication skills with that patient in the room and not making them feel uh, like they're separate from the. Um, so this is a skill I'm learning as I go. Um, I'm gonna, um, 
skip the medication part briefly, just to make sure you have plenty of time for questions. Um, but what I would just say is that there, um, there, are a, there are a couple of medications that do help patients with Alzheimer's and other dementias. There are also a lot of medications that can hurt people with Alzheimer's. They block choline. And so what, what uh, patients should do is have a good review of their medications by their primary, like set aside a visit to just talk about medications. And are there any medications that can be reduced or stopped? Again, I'm ending with resources because I think that's really important. And I will entertain questions. Thank you so much for inviting me.